Okay, good morning. The ability of the nervous system to interpret the world in which we live, process visual and auditory information, make memories, think and plan, and locomote, speak, is dependent upon specific neural circuits within the brain. And in turn, those neural circuits, the ability of the, those neural circuits to function, is dependent upon the ability of neurons to connect with each other. And the specific morphological structure that's used to make that connection is the synapse. And the process by which one neuron communicates with another neuron is called synaptic transmission. And that's what we're going to talk about in this, in the next lecture. Now it turns out, one convenient place to start talking about synaptic transmission is not about synaptic transmission in the central nervous system, but rather at the skeletal neuromuscular junction. That's a synapse made between a spinal motor neuron and a skeletal muscle cell. And the reason why we're going to start there is because a great deal is known about the process of synaptic transmission there. But the general principle about how synaptic transmission works in the neuromuscular junction is applicable to an understanding of how synaptic transmission works in the central nervous system. Now the next slide illustrates some of the key features of uh, the structure of the synapse at the neuromuscular junction. And so here is your motor axon, the cell body of which would be in the spinal cord, you see myelin. And then the motor axon branches uh, and it runs along the muscle fiber. So here's the muscle fiber, and this is the contractile machinery that you're going to learn a lot about in the physiology course. Let's look at this in a little more detail. So this is called the neuromuscular junction. So here is an expanded view of that. This is the nerve terminal. Here's the skeletal muscle with the contractile machinery. And we'll blow it up one more time to really look inside that uh, synapse. So here you see the membrane of the so-called presynaptic neuron. This is the motor neuron. And here is the membrane of the postsynaptic cell, in this case, the muscle cell. And what you see here is a number of characteristic features of this synapse and uh, most synapses in the central nervous system. One is an important morphological feature is that you see there's a distinct separation between the membrane of the presynaptic neuron and the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. And this is called the synaptic cleft. So there's a gap. What this means is that not a direct electrical contact between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. So somehow the information from the presynaptic cell has to be propagated or transmitted to the postsynaptic cell. And the way that transmission occurs is through the release of chemical transmitter substances. These chemical transmitter substances are located in the spherical structures, and this is one of the defining features of a so-called chemical synapse. These varicosities, they're called synaptic vesicles, and it's within these synaptic vesicles where the neurotransmitters are contained. So we have a high density of synaptic vesicles, we have a synaptic cleft, and we also have a high percentage of these mitochondria. And also, not clearly shown here is that there's generally a thickening, a characteristic thickening of the postsynaptic membrane, and that thickening is due to the fact that there's a high density of receptors uh, that are embedded in this membrane, and those are the receptors that are necessary to sense the chemical transmitter substance that's released. So this is an artist version. This is an artist version of how the synapse looks, and here's an actual electron micrograph showing some of these same features we talked about. So here is the presynaptic terminal, here is the postsynaptic cell, in this case the muscle cell. You see here nicely the characteristic thickening of the postsynaptic muscle cell membrane. This is where the receptors are. Also you see the contractile machinery. But of particular note is that you see these high density of the synaptic vesicles in the presynaptic terminal. Now in terms of the physiology, one of the advantages of studying synaptic transmission at the skeletal neuromuscular junction is that it's very convenient to do so in simple experimental preparations such as this one. So one can surgically remove a little bit of muscle along with a motor axon uh, from an experimental animal, a frog or a rat, and place it in a suitable medium like saline solution. And in that medium, this preparation will remain viable for a considerable period of time. 
you can impale the postsynaptic muscle cell with a microelectrode and measure the membrane potential. And uh, despite the fact that the motor axon is cut, it remains viable for a certain period of time. You can connect a stimulator to the axon, deliver an electric shock, and that will allow an action potential to be elicited in the motor axon, which will then propagate to the neuromuscular junction, which at the skeletal neuromuscular junction has a specific name called the motor end plate because it has this plate-like appearance. Okay? The next slide shows an experimental result. Let's just focus on part A. Uh, what happens when you record from the postsynaptic cell and you deliver an electric shock to the motor axon? The first thing you see is this little deflection here. This is the point in time when the shock is delivered, and uh, this is essentially an artifact of the electric shock. So the shock is delivered here, but nothing happens until you get to this point in time. And what's happening between here and here is the time it takes for the action potential, which is elicited by the shock, to propagate to the terminal and cause the release of the neurotransmitter substance. Then recording in the postsynaptic neuron, now you, two, you see two phenomena. One is this initial rising or depolarizing potential, and that initial depolarizing potential then reaches threshold, and it causes the initiation of an all or none action potential in the skeletal muscle cell. So in terms of ionic mechanisms, the ionic mechanisms of the action potential in the skeletal muscle cell are identical to the ionic mechanisms that we spoke about already in nerve cells. The initiation of the action potential is due to the voltage-dependent increase in sodium permeability. The repolarization of the action potential is due to the process of sodium inactivation and the delayed increase in potassium permeability. The action potential, though, is not the focus of this lecture. What is the focus is this underlying potential that is the trigger, the stimulus, which normally activates the action potential. Now, that underlying stimulus is obscured because as soon as the membrane potential reaches the threshold, you initiate an action potential. But you can take advantage of a drug called curare and place some curare in the extracellular medium. And curare has a very dramatic effect on the sequence of events that we record the neuromuscular junction. I should point out that curare is a poison. And it's actually used by some native uh, South Americans uh, as an arrow poison. And so an animal that is uh, poisoned with curare will asphyxiate, will die from asphyxiation, because this process of synaptic transmission at the neuromuscular junction is blocked, including the muscles that underlie respiration. Right? So you can't move, you can't contract your respiratory muscles, you can't breathe. So here's what a low dose of curare does. The low dose of curare attenuates that underlying signal, but that signal is still sufficiently large to reach threshold and fire an action potential. So this is actually known as the safety factor. The underlying potential is always sufficiently large that it triggers an action potential. And that potential can be made smaller, and it's still sufficient to trigger an action potential. But here you see, with a higher dose of curare, now that potential is further reduced, revealing its true underlying time course. And we call this potential the end plate potential. So this has a very specific meaning. It's just not a potential that you record at the motor end plate. It is called the end plate potential. Here is a potential, the action potential. It's at the end plate, but it's not the end plate potential. This is the action potential. The underlying event is the end plate potential. It's really important that you get that distinction, distinction clear in your mind. An action potential at the end plate is not the end plate potential. This is the end plate <coughs> potential, the underlying trigger event which initiates, leads to the initiation of the action potential, right? So the end plate potential is like the match that you use to ignite the gunpowder, right? This is the end plate potential. That provides the heat to ignite the gunpowder. The end plate potential is the depolarization that's normally used to activate or initiate the action potential. Okay, so what are some of the properties of, of the end plate potential? Is it propagated in an all unknown fashion like the action potential? And so here you see an experiment that tests that hypothesis. So the motor, the skeletal muscle cell, here the skeletal muscle cell is not just penetrated with one electrode, but several electrodes along the length of the muscle cell. <coughs> 
at various distances from the motor end plate. And here you see end plate potentials recorded at these various distances. I should point out in this experiment was done in the presence of a low concentration of Ferrari, such that the end plate potential did not trigger an action potential. Right? We don't want to trigger an action potential because then we'll be looking at propagation of the action potential, not propagation of the end plate potential. So you see here is your normal, if you will, end plate potential recorded here. As you go more distant regions, you see that the end plate potential gets smaller and smaller. So this means the end plate potential is propagated passively, just as though it's small depolarization or hyperpolarization is propagated passively. It's just like if you take the lighter and heat up the rod, you're going to heat it up, but that temperature is only going to spread a certain distance, right? Only if the cigarette lighter ignites the gunpowder will you get the propagation of the, the ignition of the, the fuse and the propagation of the action potential. Okay, so it's, pa it's, it's propagated passively. If the end plate potential is sufficiently large, then it triggers an action potential. So this table summarizes everything we're going to talk about in this lecture. So it gives you an advanced treatment if you know all of this already, you're way ahead of the game. And some of you might have had a lot of this in your college uh, courses already. So here's a cartoon that describes the steps involved, starting with an action potential and ending up with a muscle contraction. First of all, you have the synthesis and storage of acetylcholine in those presynaptic terminals of the motor axon. So the acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter substance that we're going to be talking about. Right? An action potential initiated in the cell body of the spinal motor neuron propagates to the synaptic terminal, and there that action potential leads to the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine diffuses into the synaptic cleft, crosses the synaptic cleft, where it binds to receptors on the postsynaptic, or the, also called the postjunctional membrane. Right? As a result of acetylcholine binding to those receptors, there is a simultaneous increase in the permeability of sodium and potassium. As a result of that simultaneous increase in permeability, the membrane potential approaches a value of depolarization halfway between the sodium and the potassium equilibrium potential. So there's a depolarization, and that produces a potential called the end plate potential. More generally, that potential is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential. We talked about these already in the first lecture, excitatory because they tend to depolarize the cell, postsynaptic because it's a potential on the postsynaptic side of the synapse. If that depolarization is sufficiently large, and normally it is sufficiently large, it triggers an action potential in the muscle cell that then elicits this process of excitation, contraction, coupling, and the development of tension. Now, the end plate potential is a transient event. It's a little bit longer than the action potential by itself. You see the top calibration bar here, but it's still transient. Why is it transient? It's transient for two reasons. Uh, one <coughs> is that the acetylcholine that's released in the synaptic cleft diffuses away. The other is there is an enzyme in the synaptic cleft that actively hydrolyzes acetylcholine into inactive form. That enzyme is called acetylcholine esterase. I really knew I was looking at it. Was it? I really knew. <laughs> And actually, acetylcholine esterase is a very important molecule, uh, and some of its actions uh, are shown here. Because there's an interesting agent that's been identified, uh, actually a family of agents, one of which is neostigmine. And uh, neostigmine has some very interesting uh, effects at the process of synaptic transmission. What neostigmine does is it blocks the actions of acetylcholine esterase. So if you didn't think that acetylcholine esterase was important in limiting the duration of the end plate potential, you can clearly see its effects right here. So here is an experiment where the motor axon is stimulated at this point in time, and you record this end plate potential. Now this end plate potential is small. Notice the scale, one millivolt. That's because we're already treating this system with some Ferrari. So this is really not a normal end plate potential. This is one that's already been reduced by applying some Ferrari. So it doesn't trigger an action potential. 
We don't want to trigger an action potential because we want to focus just on the effects or the process of uh, the end point potential. So when you repeat this experiment in the presence of neostigmine, now you see that the end plate potential is larger and longer lasting. So there's actually uh, some important clinical uses of neostigmine like compounds. Anybody know of some of the clinical applications? <coughs> Myosin and gravis. Yes, great. So, <laughs> so acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitors are used uh, to treat myosin and gravis. What is myosin and gravis? We, we learned about that in the first lecture. It's an autoimmune disease. It's associated with muscular weakness. And it's an autoimmune disease that's associated with a decreased number of acetylcholine receptors. So an individual who has myosthenia gravis will have a decreased number of acetylcholine receptors. Let's say instead of there being 1,000 receptors at each synapse, maybe there's going to be 500 receptors at each synapse. Therefore, the end plate potential will be smaller. In a, se in a, sense, in a sense, someone with myosthenia gravis is like someone who has um, taken a low dose of curare. So the end plate potential is going to be reduced. So that safety factor that we talked about, sometimes the action potential, the end plate potential is going to be able to initiate an action potential, and sometimes it's not. Therefore, the muscle will not be activated as reliably as it is in a normal individual. So how can we treat someone that has myosin and gravis? We can't, it would be nice to cure them. If we had some gene therapy technique, we could express some additional acetylcholine receptors. But in the absence of that, what would be a viable treatment option? Inhibit the acetylcholine esterase so that the acetylcholine that is there can be around for a longer period of time, activating a greater number of receptors that are still left. Okay? It's also used in another disorder. Excuse me? Alzheimer's disease. Okay, what's Alzheimer's disease? Neurodegenerative disease, 4.5 million Americans, and uh, it's estimated that people over 85 have a 50% chance of uh, being afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. So if you come back here, um, 40 years from now, 45, 50 years from now, so either the person to the right or the person to the left of you will have Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so it's a degenerative disease. It's associated with loss of, of brain neurons. But in particular, in the early stages, it's due to loss of cholinergic neurons. So you're losing cholinergic neurons. So why should neostigmine like comp uh, compounds help with Alzheimer's disease? You have less acetylcholine. So there's less acetylcholine being released from neurons. So if you treat a person with neostigmine, the acetylcholine that is released, even though it's, some, it's going to be down because, you're, because some of the acetylcholine neurons have been destroyed by the disease, the remaining acetylcholine neurons that are function, functioning, their function will be boosted because of the presence of the neostigmine. So the acetylcholine that they do release is going to have a greater and longer lasting effect. So in one case, you're releasing less acetylcholine, it's Alzheimer's disease, and using neostigmine. In the other case, you have fewer receptors and you're using neostigmine. The site of action is, uh, of the two diseases is different, but the therapy can do the same thing. Here's an interesting technique that uh, allows one to further explore the process of synaptic transmission at the neuromuscular junction. It's called iontophoresis. So you can take a microelectrode. Now, rather than taking using the microelectrode to record the potential, you can fill a microelectrode with a drug, in this case acetylcholine, and, and if the molecule is charged, and acetylcholine is a positively charged molecule, you can use this technique to squirt, if you will, a small amount of acetylcholine right in the vicinity of the neuromuscular junction or any place you want to put this electrode. So here you connect the electrode to this switch into a battery, the positive pole which is oriented like this, 
So what do you think is going to happen when you close the switch? Positive charge here, acetylcholine is positive. They don't like each other. What's going to happen? It's going to squirt out some acetylcholine, and it's going to go in this region of the you know, neuromuscular junction. And the question is, is it going to produce a change in potential? Yes. Here, here is the uh, experiment. Again, this says normal end plate potential. This would be one of course in Girardi, because note how small it is. So here's when you stimulate the motor axon, you get the end plate potential. And here is when you squirt out a little acetylcholine, and you get a potential that looks just like the end plate potential. And this potential, just like the end plate potential, gets bigger if you apply some neostigmine, it gets smaller if you apply some curare. You get no response when you inject the acetylcholine into the muscle cell. Why is that? Because there's the receptors are on the outside of the membrane. Yeah. It's, it's conceivable that you could get a response because some receptors are nuclear, right? So it's not a weird experiment that you can think there could be a possibility. And not in this case. The receptors are on the outside surface of the membrane. If you position this electrode so it's not up right above the neuromuscular junction, but if you squirt some acetylcholine over here, what do you think happens? Smaller, really, you get nothing because the receptors for acetylcholine, and rightly so, are concentrated right below the neuromuscular junction. Why have acetylcholine receptors over here when there's no release of transmitter here? And finally, this response is not affected by tetrodotoxin. But this response is affected by tetrodotoxin. What's the difference? So the fact that this response is not affected by tetrodotoxin indicates that the ionic mechanism for the end plate potential is different from the ionic mechanism for the action potential, where you had the voltage dependent increase in sodium permeability. And remember, tetrodotoxin plugs up the sodium channel, the voltage dependent sodium channel. Here, you can squirt on this acetylcholine and have an end plate potential that is a potential that looks like an end plate potential that is unaffected by tetrodotoxin. But this potential is blocked by tetrodotoxin. What's the difference, the key difference? <coughs> it gets to the issue of direct versus indirect effects. When you stimulate the motor axon over here, what happens? What has to happen? You have to initiate an action potential that then propagates to the terminal to release the transmitter. In the presence of tetrodotoxin, you can initiate an action potential. So tetrodotoxin would block this response, not because it's blocking the channels that underlie the end plate potential, because, however, it's blocking the ability of the action potential to be initiated and cause the release of the transmitter. That distinction clear. Whenever you have a question about how a drug is acting, you always have to ask yourself, is it a direct effect or an indirect effect? Now, ionophoresis can seem like a very esoteric effect, but it's actually used as a drug delivery system in some cases. If you have a drug that's charged, you can put some drug in a little electrode here, and put a neutral electrode here, and you can put these electrodes on the skin, and you can turn on the stimulator, and the drug will be released from the electrode because it's, 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 a, it's a positive charge. It will be released. It will be picked up in the bloodstream. And so you have a way of a drug delivery system without sticking someone with it. Now, here is uh, that channel that is opened by acetylcholine. So we have talked about, up to this point in the, in the class, two different types, two basic types of memory channels. We talked about the channel that underlies the resting potential. That's a channel that's permeable to sodium, potassium, and it is independent of membrane potential. It's always open. Then we talked about voltage-dependent or voltage-gated channels. Those are channels like the voltage-dependent sodium channel and the voltage-dependent potassium channel. Those are channels in the membrane that are normally closed but open in response to a depolarization. So there's a conformational change in the protein which allows ions to go into or out of the channel. Now we're introducing you to a third type of membrane channel, a third fundamentally different 
channel. This is a channel which is normally closed. So here, it's normally closed. But it is capable of being opened as a result of a neurotransmitter binding to the channel. That produces a conformational change. So here is two molecules of acetylcholine. They're coming down from the presynaptic neuron. This is the synaptic cleft. Those acetylcholine molecules, and you need two molecules to open one channel. And what happens as a result of the binding of the transmitter, there's a conformational change in the channel. The channel opens, and what do you think is going to happen? Sodium is in high concentration here. It wants to go into the cell. Potassium is in high concentration in the, inside the cell. It wants to go out. So the sodium is going to go in. The potassium goes out. And the net effect is a depolarization. You're going to approach. This is like making alpha in the Goldman equation, 1. And therefore, the membrane potential will approach this value of about zero millivolts. And the opening of a single channel produces a potential, a very small potential, of about a half a microvolt. Come back to that number later. Half a microvolt for one channel. One channel produces a potential of a half a mic microvolt. Okay, now let's talk about the mechanisms of neurotransmitter release. That's a really interesting uh, story. So how is it that the active potential which invades the synaptic terminal causes the release of the transmitter substance? Well, the key here is something called the calcium hypothesis for chemical synaptic transmission. And there's two parts to it. There's part A and there's part B. So part A essentially says that just as there are voltage-dependent sodium channels, there are also voltage-dependent calcium channels. In fact, the structure of these channels are remarkably similar. Somebody asked the other day about the structure of these channels, you can uh, mutate a single amino acid on a sodium channel and turn it into a potassium channel, uh, into a calcium channel. So the basic idea is that as you depolarize, you produce a conformational change in those channels. They open calcium, then and the, the channel becomes permeable to calcium. Now part B is the next uh, consequence of that increase in calcium permeability. So calcium is in high concentration outside the cell, low concentration inside the cell. So what would be the consequence of increasing the calcium permeability? You would get a depolarization, but you'd also have an influx of calcium. What's the, cal what's the concentration of calcium outside in the extracellular medium? When you get on the clinic, they're going to ask you that question. You don't want to get burnt, better know it now. There was a chart in the physiology, the first day of physiology, there was a chart with all the different ion concentrations. Give me a number. 2.5. 2 hey, great. That's, that's a good number. What about the intracellular concentration? 10 to 100 nanomolar. Great. So it's there. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of physiologist who was <laughs> okay, so it's very low in the nanomolar range, and so if it's in the millimolar range outside, the nanomolar range inside, you know, if you open the calcium channel, calcium is going to go from the outside to the inside. Also, the inside of the cell is negative, so it's a double feature. You know, not only wants to follow its concentration gradient, but it wants to go inside the cell because the inside of the cell is negative. Right? So, as a result of the increase in calcium permeability, there is an increase in calcium concentration. Small, it's a small increase, but you don't have to increase it much because it's so low to begin with, right? Now, here's the next important part is because of that increase in calcium, there is an increase in the transmitter release. So the transmitter release is calcium dependent. If you have a little bit of calcium, you might get a little bit of transmitter release. If you have a lot of calcium, you get more transmitter release. Calcium facilitates that release of transmitter, the fusion of those vesicles with the membrane so they can release their contents. Here's an experiment that performed back in the 50s that provided some, 1950s that is, some important insights into this process of neuromuscular synaptic transmission and chemical synapse. So here's an experiment that was done in the absence, the critical thing here is this experiment was done in the absence of any stimulation. And what you see here in these traces are recordings from the neuromuscular junction continuously going from left 
to the right and down the page. So this trace is a continuation of this one, and this trace is a continuation of this one, and so forth. And so there's no stimulation, but the remarkable thing is that you see occasionally, and look at the scale bar here, you see these small potentials that occur spontaneously. And they occur at a rate of about once every 50 milliseconds or so. And what's also interesting is that if you plot or measure the amplitude of each one of these little deflections, and you plot them on a graph like this. So you plot the amplitude of the deflection versus the number of times you see that particular amplitude. What you see is a kind of unimodal distribution. So what this means is that these are all in the same population of underlying events, and they have a mean of about a half a millivolt or so in amplitude. Half a millivolt in amplitude. So, Bernard Katz, who first observed these potentials, and who later went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, called these miniature end-plate potentials. Why miniature end-plate potentials? Well, they were small. Compared to the normal end-plate potential, which is about 50 millivolts in amplitude, these were only about a half a millivolt in amplitude. So they're 100 times less in amplitude. End plate potentials, miniature end plate potentials, because they were recorded at the end plate. In fact, if you took your microelectrode and instead of recording it from the motor end plate, you moved it at some distant regions, you don't record miniature end plate potentials anymore. So there's something about a relationship between these guys and the synapse. The other thing was that if you put on some Ferrari, the amplitude of these miniature end plate potentials would get smaller. Low dose of Ferrari, they get a little bit smaller. A higher dose of Ferrari, they get even smaller. And if you put on some neostigmine, what do you think happened? It got bigger. So they behaved just like, in a sense, the normal end plate potential, except two major differences. One is they were very small, and two, they occurred spontaneously. So what does this mean? So what Katz uh, suggested was that what's happening is because of that, those high concentrations of vesicles in the synaptic terminal, and because there's some basal calcium in the presynaptic terminal, occasionally some of those are going to be spontaneously released. So it's like, it's like if this was, a, this was a synapse, and it had these uh, synaptic transmitter molecules in there, <laughs> just by chance, just by chance, my, my hand is calcium. Just by chance, some of those are going to be released at about once every 50 milliseconds. Something like that, right? It's just, it's just a lot of vesicles, a lot of transmitters. Right? Have all these have all these varicosities. You'll get your chance. <laughs> You have all these veritas, right? So that's the spontaneous release. What about the normal release? Remember this graph? So a little bit of calcium <coughs> causes a little bit of release. A lot of calcium. Now we have those voltage dependent changes in calcium permeability. If we have an action potential, we're going to get a big change in permeability, a big increase in calcium. So now my hand, which is the calcium, now we have a whole bunch of calcium coming in. <laughs> That's what happens with an action potential. Another action <laughs> to this uh, on Wednesday when we talk about synaptic plasticity, know what happened here. We released the transmitter and now it's become a little bit depleted. <laughs>
Okay, here's the real thing. Here's the real thing. Here are those synaptic vesicles. You see right here, these synaptic vesicles have been caught uh, in the process of uh, releasing their content. Now, how much transmitter substance, how much transmitter substance is released as a result of, it's associated with one of these little miniature end plate detections? Well, the simplest thing is one molecule, well, let's just say two molecules, we know that two molecules of acetylcholine are necessary to open a channel. So you can say, okay, it's just two molecules of acetylcholine that are being spontaneously released and lead to the opening of the channel. But here's the key thing. Remember the potential that's associated with two molecules of acetylcholine? What was the value? Half a millivolt? This is a half a millivolt. I said it, I said it about 10 minutes ago. A half a microvolt. A half a microvolt. So two molecules of acetylcholine produce a potential of a half a microvolt. What is this? This is a half a millivolt. So what does that tell you? In order to get a miniature end plate potential, you need to have at least 2,000 molecules of acetylcholine. So what's the answer? Is that this, these little M&M &M packets, these are not a molecule of acetylcholine. Each one of these packets contains thousands of molecules of acetylcholine. Just like there's thousands of M&Ms in each one of these packages. <laughs> each one of these M&Ms is like an acetylcholine molecule. And each one of those vesicles that we talked about contains 10,000, if you will, M&Ms. 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine. So each one of these packages, so two molecules of acetylcholine produce a half a microvolt. 1,000 or 10,000 molecules, you get a little waste. 10,000 molecules are released, producing a potential of a half a millivolt. So what does that tell you about how many molecules are released when you get an action potential invading the terminal and producing an end plate potential? Not a miniature end plate potential, an end plate potential. Do the math. Half a millivolt, what's the size of the end plate potential? 50 millivolts. 50 divided by 0.5 equals 100 vesicles. So when you have a normal action potential invading the synaptic tract, the, the, the neuromuscular junction, you get the release of 100 vesicles, each vesicle containing about 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine, each vesicle producing a potential of about half a millivolts. Well, those half a millivolts, those 100 half a millivolts add up to produce the end plate potential. So here is a diagram that summarizes almost everything we've talked about in the first couple of hours. So here is the presynaptic neuron, here's the postsynaptic neuron, in this case the muscle cell. We've talked a lot about, when you boil it down, much of what we've talked about is about membrane channels. This was the first channel we talked about. This was the channel that endows neurons with the resting potential, all cells with the resting potential, is highly permeable to potassium only slightly permeable to sodium. Alpha value is 0.01. Just as you have these channels in the nerve cell that underlies the resting potential, you also have these channels in the muscle cell that underlies the resting potential of the muscle cell, right? Then we talked about this channel, the voltage dependent sodium channel. It's a channel that is normally closed, but it can be, and it's selectively permeable to sodium. As a result of the depolarization, it's a conformational change, it opens. This channel is blocked by controlled toxin. Then you have this voltage-dependent potassium channel. Uh, and this contributes to the repolarization of the action potential. This is blocked by tetraethyl ammonium. Then we introduce today the calcium channel. It's just like the sodium channel, but it has a selective permeability to calcium. As a result of the depolarization produced by the action potential, this channel opens. Calcium is in high concentration outside, goes into the cell, and it causes the release of these vesicles of neurotransmitter. Each one of these vesicles contains about 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine. These are the little dots, the big sphere of the circle. The acetylcholine is released. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft, where it binds to this other class of receptors. These are the transmitter or ligand-gated receptors. As a result of acetylcholine binding to this channel, the two molecules of acetylcholine, there is a conformational change, producing a simultaneous increase in sodium-potassium permeability. That produces the end plate potential. And the end plate potential
if, if it's sufficiently large, and it is always, except in disease states, it leads to the opening of voltage-dependent and sodium and potassium channels in the skeletal muscle cell, leading to an action potential in the skeletal muscle cell. So that's the whole story of events, starting with the action potential in your spinal motor neuron to the action potential in the muscle cell and the subsequent uh, twitch. Okay, so in the next lecture, what we're going to do is talk about uh, synaptic transmission in the central nervous system. We now know how it works in the periphery. To what extent are these mechanisms going to be applicable to synaptic transmission in the central nervous system? Okay, back in 10 minutes.